about a month ago or two months ago when I had this idea was that this is the only thing the whole world has in common. You're right. And so totally right. how do the people react to the same common thing? And that, I think it's, an, it's, a, it's something I like to study. I'm, I'm a chemist, so I, you know, I'm not going to study like most people would do psychiatry-wise. But um, So I'm, I'm reaching out to other countries for this uh, as well. And then uh, we'll get them all compiled and we'll have a big exhibit. Now, I've already got interest from some major airports to have this on display as long, along with, um, I mean, major meaning Cleveland, Dulles, Reagan, um, and also... They're, they're, they have all their friends on their airports they have too, as well as Walter Reed uh, Medical Center in DC. Wow, very, very cool. So uh, that was my way of, of plugging for the artists because the artists are doing it for free. So I'm gonna say, listen, uh -huh. I'll, give, I'll give you exposure, okay? This is my yeah. exposure. Because <laughs> right. I am not an artist at all, but I gotta try to market it to them to say, please give me your time and your, you know, I'm, I'm supplying them with the materials. But I yeah, can't, I, sure. you know, I still draw stick figures, so I can't, there's no way I'm going to do any kind of art. Yeah, I am not artistic either. No, not at all. Yeah. So yeah. real quick, um, you became, you, what was your, just a little background, your interest in, in pathology came from when, and when did you start with the, uh, the decided to do that? Yeah, you know, I'm an emergency physician by trade, so uh, started in 1990 uh, in Ohio, and um, you know, over my career, you know, I've taken care of, uh, of a lot of different uh, patients and, you know, I would normally work, I work in a busy emergency department and would usually have a, a patient every day or every other day that would pass, uh, you know, and die on my watch and, you know, realizing that there's certain things that are, you know, out of our control, even as physicians and, then, you know, we'd also have, you know, criminal cases, murders, and that kind of thing. So, I mean, I've always been a uh, adrenaline junkie and always interested in, you know, what happened, what was the cause, that kind of thing. And then an uh, opportunity, uh, uh, the um, Republican Party in my county was looking for somebody to run his corner. And, you know, I've always been fascinated with forensics, even though emergency medicine was my path. And I thought, well, I you know, have been emergency doc for 20 years. And um, actually I had just, um, and still working as a, a chief medical informatics officer, working with computerization and digitalization of the medical record. So I've got that skill set, and I thought, well, this would be a neat uh, evolution of my career. And there was an opportunity. So I ran for Stark County Coroner and was elected uh, late, uh, early November of last year and started January 4th of this year. Fantastic. Yeah. I like to talk to you later uh, about the courses we're teaching here and, and my students that, and what we've got. And um, Dr. Burton had a couple of students of mine view some of the um, autopsies. And this is what he said. He, he said that he knew that the person that was there, he said he knew that she'll be a good, uh, she's chosen the right field because when they unzipped the bag, she leaned in to see what was going on versus going like, <laughs> versus leaning back. Yes. <laughs> It's all about the body language, and she passed the first test. So that's great. We can discuss that later, though. So, all right. So, that's great. when you first heard about the whole COVID pandemic, what month was it, and what did you think about it at that time as a physician? Yeah, you know, so obviously it hit um, our county and in our area early part of last year. Um, I wasn't in my current role as coroner then. Um, but, you know, that really changed again. I was in the informatics role. And so that really kind of moved us from, you know, going to the hospital. So I'm a, I was a hospital based chief medical informatics officer and, you know, was really always going into my office at the hospital. And, you know, we had meeting uh, quite a few meetings where there'd be a group of us sitting around a table. And then when COVID hit, you know, that basically put a screech to everything, you know, people tried to avoid the hospital setting as much as possible. I think their big fear was that, you know, people would get infected if they went to the hospital. Yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, we started working remotely. I think the, the, uh, the computer people really worked on how do we get so many people working remotely. And, you know, we have a, a lot of uh, files that are important for our work that we put on a shared drive that you could only access from the hospital. So we didn't really have a lot of these VPNs, these virtual private networks access and stuff like that. So, you know, there was really a scramble to that. So, um, you know, from that standpoint, you know, uh, our 
the majority of our hospital that could work remotely got shifted away from the hospital setting into the uh, uh, you know to their home uh, home setting or coming in on alternating weeks so that again if, if somebody did get sick you know it's not like you know everybody came down with it because that could wipe the department out you know especially with the you know uh, there's so much unknown at the point in time yeah. so you know really trying to protect each other and, and stay separated as much as, as possible now how did what was demands on you at that point because I would think that they want to know information as much as possible about this and, and there's you know is we were needing information, you know, right. on, by the hour. So did your demand increase in that area? Um, in the computer realm, it, it did. Um, and obviously, information was hard to get because of conflicting news. Yep. Um, you know, and, and I think part of it was that, you know, it's just the unknown. And even, you know, today, I mean, we still have, uh, so we, we've been able, our, our hospital has been, picked as a site uh, with the uh, super refrigeration or freezing ability for the vaccine. So we're one of the, uh, I think, 10, cho 10 or 11 chosen st uh, sites in the state of Ohio to be able to dispense the first couple waves of the vaccine. And even then, you know, people are like, okay, well, you know, if you had COVID, should you get it right away? Should you wait? How long am I going to be protected for? How long does it take for the antibodies to protect? And so, you know, just, you know, and I, I tell people, it's just, it, it, I know you get frustrating because again, you hear different things and, um, you know, it, it, and the, so I think that the science uh, piece of it is, um, is not there. So there's a lot of conjecture. Um, I, I mean, there is some science, but most of it so far has not been based on science and it will be clear looking back i think two three four years from now but you know right now you know it's again people are saying all right in a year am i going to need a booster vaccine well you could people may say yes people may say no i don't know if we know the answer to that yeah yet, you know so we're gonna have to obviously carry titers out and that kind of thing because again we're so young in this pandemic now you say you guys have been chosen as a, as a super as a site storage because of your capabilities in the, in the what does the temperature have to be down to to keep the vaccine? How big has this got to be? Uh, yeah, so it doesn't have to be big per se, but you have to have the ability to uh, freeze. I want to say it's, I got to swear it was like a, a 110 degrees uh, below freezing Fahrenheit. Wow. Yeah, I think it's like, I'm, I'm got a couple numbers in my head. I want to it, it's, I want to say it is something close to that. So, you know, not a lot of um, hospitals have that ability no. to do that um, and to keep it that cold and obviously back up generator if you lose power no. and that kind of thing, because we've obviously heard of those issues as well. What hospital is that then? Pardon? What hospital uh, what was oh, that? Oh, Altman, A-U-L-T-M-A-N hospital. Okay, excellent. In Canton, Canton, Ohio, yes. Fantastic. Okay, so yeah. in your experience as a, as a, as a non-coroner then, uh, what was your experience with COVID at that point? from there until it became coroner? Yeah, so it was, I think, like most other people, um, you know, really hearing it on the news, hearing, uh, you know, friends that may have come down with COVID or family members. Actually, I had uh, a brother-in-law in Youngstown. He was probably one of the first cases in that area that got it. He was a, what really wasn't sure how he got it. And, um, you know, I know his, he thought that maybe he picked it up from his daughter who traveled up from Columbus and, um, cause they, cause I think she tested positive as well. And then it was kind of ironic because then, you know, people were starting to do testing later on to see, okay, were you still positive or not? And, you know, that whole, um, you know, the difficulty around, okay, geez, you're positive, even though you aren't having symptoms anymore, but right. you didn't have symptoms. Are you allowed to be exposed to people or not? So, you know, kind of just helping navigate some of the clinical people, even though I no longer was clinical, but. By, by reading the science that we had, the, you know, cases up to that point and, and trying to put some logic, you know, around it. I know, like my, like I said, my sister whose husband had it and whose daughter had it. So she, I think it was like three or four months later, you know, she went to go back to school down in Columbus and she wanted an antibody test to see whether she, if she quote, you know, still has it or is protected. And I said, well, the thing is, we don't know the sensitivities the specificity, what the threshold is for picking up right now on that test. So, you know, you may drive yourself crazy. So here her, 
my sister and her daughter both went to get the antibody test and they both tested negative. She's like, how can that be? And she was all frustrated. I said, again, you know, we don't know what the threshold of that is. We don't know what, you know, your daughter's uh, antibody level was. So if the threshold was 500 antibodies and she had 499, it's going to show up negative, but she's still maybe protected. We just don't know that. And so, you know, kind of really working through and, and helping others kind of navigate this unknown um, as logical as we could with, you know, again, not a lot of information. And you became the family expert because you're the physician. Right. So they all come to right. you for the, oh man, I get to see that. Yeah, yeah, so I'm used to that. I mean, I get, I get uh, consults from friends and family kind of all over, all over the country. Sure. <laughs> you know, once a week or at least every other week kind of thing. But, uh, you know, I've, I've been blessed to be a physician and have that knowledge. So I try to share as much as I can with that. Yeah, hey, brother-in-law, I got a pain in my foot. What is it? I can see that. <laughs> Yeah, well, if you take that nail out, it's not there. <laughs> That's it. All right, so then you became coroner. Yes. And what did what did you see then in terms of? I, I don't know what the COVID protocol is for your for your uh, for Stark County Coroner's Office. Yeah. So how the coroner's office works, you know, our job is to be a voice uh, for the deceased. So you know, trying to make sure that there wasn't criminal activity, um, you know, and or, you know, make sure that there was the, you know, proper cause of death sought, uh, you know, homicides, suicides, uh, overdoses, those kind of things. So um, every uh, death that happens in our county is supposed to notify the coroner's office. Now, um, I have coroner investigators that usually filled those calls and, if it's a pretty straightforward case, we don't really um, document other than we have a little, uh, you know, index card that we fill out with information. So as an example, you know, if there's a 84 year old nursing home patient that, you know, has uh, diabetes and chronic obstructive lung disease and they came down with COVID at the nursing home and they, you know, didn't want to be resuscitated or anything, or even if they did and, you know, they transported to the hospital and died a couple of days later from COVID, you know, they have known diagnoses. Doesn't sound like there was any foul play there. So my corner, and if their, their treating physician at the time agrees that, you know, everything seems straightforward from that standpoint, then, um, the treating physician would sign the death certificate. They would notify our office. Our office would say, okay, it's not a coroner's case. And, um, you know, then, you know, the, the patient will go or the decedent will go to the funeral home or cremation or what have you. And that will really, other than us having a little note card, we don't really keep stats on that. What we do see is twofold. One is those cases that come in that are unknown. So we just had one uh, this week where we had a, I think 65 year old gentleman uh he kind of gets treated by a homeopath he takes you know some vitamins and things but had been previously fairly healthy he started having fever chills and a cough i think it was like february 7th or so and then on the uh i think the over the last weekend um started becoming more short of breath uh and a cough his uh, wife went and got some cough medicine she goes to work, she comes back a couple hours later, and he had passed at home. Well, you know, they call EMS 911, they go there, it's like, well, he's already had passed. So they'll, that becomes a coroner's case because he was, quote, previously healthy, he doesn't really have a treating physician. Mm -hmm. so, you know, so we examine the patient, try to find out, you know, was there a suspicion for a homicide here? You know, was there a suicide? Or did he die of something else? We, you know, we as we examined him, we didn't really see any other specific cause was suspicious for COVID, especially during the pandemic. So we sent off a COVID test. He came back positive. So you know, so we so we've had those where, you know, obviously before COVID hit, we weren't testing for COVID. It, um, you know, typically this is still influenza flu season, and right. you know, in the in the past we have significant mortality from influenza, and this year it's been pretty much non-existent in our county. We haven't had one. In fact, the hospital that I'm affiliated with, uh, Altman, I think we've only had three in hospital in-house we call them or hospitalized patients with influenza, where we've had typically thousands by this time. So wow. You know, the, the, the amount of influenza this year and thus is almost non-existent um, 
And, why do you think know, that I is? Had, what is your idea why that is? What do you think? Well, it's interesting because I had a conversation with one of my corner investigators about that here uh, last week because I said, well, all right, is it because people knew that COVID was bad? They didn't want to get sick. They didn't want to go to the hospital. So is it that 95% of us went out and got the flu vaccine? I don't think so. My, my gut feeling is that you know, because it seems like there's more of us today, I think, than there has been in time, paranoid about the safety of vaccines, and there's yep. more and more people that are not getting vaccinated. So I don't believe, but I, again, I don't, I don't know the numbers, and I haven't seen them, but I don't believe that it's because more people got vaccinated. I truly believe it's because of the uh, lack of socialization, the wearing of masks, and the uh, you know more uh, cleaning our hands, using hand sanitizers, etc. I believe that is probably why influenza is the transmission has been down, and we've seen so little of it in our county. So again, we kind of said, all right, well, once we found because the flu season typically for us, I think it's September first through or October first through March thirtieth. 31st i'm trying to how many month days are in uh, march but um yeah so once that typically is over that that's your, your classic flu se season then we'll be able to have the statistics statistics you know how many people have because we still vet can vaccinate even now or up through that time so you know trying to find out what those numbers are and then looking back on it but i believe it's probably from the you know social distancing wearing masks hand sanitizer hopefully people aren't going out as much when they're ill uh, you know, respecting other people's uh, uh, potential disease processes and things and trying to protect others, uh, although not everybody feels that way. But, you know, I think more of us uh, do than don't. And, um, you know, so, so you, you went from a thousand usually to, to less than 10? Correct. Wow. Yeah, significant. From October till now, usually you're in the thousands and now you have less than 10. That's crazy. Is that nationwide? Do you know? Have you heard of anybody else in the state? Uh, yeah, I well, we have. Um, yeah, I don't have numbers for the state and haven't had time to look that up. But you know, I'll bet that that is probably you know nationwide and and you know everybody's flu season is different right. across the world as well, type of thing. But um, yeah, I'll I'll bet that that is probably pretty consistent with, wow. with the, everywhere else. Wow, I never, never even thought about that. Because you yeah. heard the fear of that. You heard the fear of, well, it's going to be a compound with the flu. It's going to be even worse because of the flu is going to mm -hmm. be around. But but it, it never happened. Wow. No, no, it sure hasn't. So the COVID cases that you've had, um, how many, when you say as far as the population, can you estimate what, what's the majority of the population as far as your COVID cases in terms of deaths are concerned? Um, yeah, you know, I don't know if I have those numbers. We haven't really seen any... Uh, it, through the coroner's office, uh, P any pediatric cases, they have mostly been elderly. Okay. Um, and so, so again, so most of the COVID cases that have a treating physician that are pretty clear cut don't come to us of right. those that are unknown cases that come in for 2020. And I do have some numbers. So we end up testing 17 uh, decedents and we had four positives and 13 negatives. And then for 2021, so far, we've had three that we've tested. And I mentioned about the gentleman that we just had that was positive, and we've had two negatives. So th those are of the um, uh, the limited cases that come to us as unknowns that we then you know, try to grab the history from any family, if there are any medical records of recent uh you know hospital visits or you know emergency visits type of thing and, and trying to piece you know the puzzle together to to try to figure out the cause of death for uh these decedents now the other th um thing that i hadn't mentioned to you yet but i was planning on is that we also have a storage cooler that we got from the state um under their mass ca mass casualty plan mm -hmm. to really help the uh, funeral homes because they have been inundated with decedents. So like I mentioned, those cases that have a treating physician that will uh, agree to the cause of death and sign a death certificate and nothing suspicious, those won't come to us. But obviously the funeral home still, uh, you know, have their work to do. So we've had a, a, our storage cooler, I think we got in 
November, if I'm not mistaken, and we have the capacity to have uh, to store 18 decedents there. And I think we've had it over half full for a period of time. Now, over the last two weeks, that has dropped down. I think we only have one present there, but the crematories are backed up, the funeral homes are backed up. And so, you know, we have to had to help them store bodies, and we don't have the capacity right, uh, in our current coroner's office to, uh, to be able to help them out. So we were able to get a storage, or a, a storage trailer, a uh, refrigerated trailer from the uh, state of Ohio, match casualty plan to be able to help them out in that capacity. So, you know, that right there we could see as hospital uh, admissions, you know, I know at, at Altman, like I said, we, there was a time where we had, you know, 115, um, you know, and equivalent to that number of admissions that had COVID. And, you know, I think now today we're down into like the 30s. And as we saw those numbers start dropping down below 100, you know, sure enough, the, uh, the, the storage trailer that we had, there were less and less uh, need for that because in the funeral homes and the crematories were able to, uh, to keep up. But that's obviously something that, you know, we haven't really had here in Stark County a need for, for that. But we have had because of the, uh, the, the number of deaths overall in the, uh, our county and I'm sure the state. Do you have, a, you know, you just, you just gave me a whole industry I didn't even think about before. I would love to interview the same thing with a, with a person from the funeral home in your area. Do you have anybody you can, I'll send you an email on this. Okay. But do you have somebody I can talk to? Because it's a whole area I didn't even think about. Yep, sure is, boy. Yeah, they, they have, uh, yeah, they're, they're seeing it on a, on a different capacity. Yeah, holy cow. I never even thought about that. Holy yep. cow. Wow. What other types of, uh, let's say, secondary effects have you seen from the COVID crisis that you wouldn't normally have seen? You know, I th we were talking about that here at the coroner's office, and I think our um, uh, opi opioid and overdoses and suicides are probably uh, up uh, from that um, feeling of, you know, the social isolation that people have. Um, you know, I, I know, you know, you just talking to people in general, the stress of, you know, having family members that are hospitalized and they can't go see them, even if they don't have COVID, if they're in for another reason, because, you know, of the fear and the, the hospital rules around, you know, trying to protect the, their current inpatients and not wanting to, you know, infect a significant amount there. Same thing with nursing homes. So you kind of, you know, you kind of feel for, you know, I, I, I kind of worry, I think that's going to be a a fairly long standing scar that we have from the standpoint of even, you know, people not able to grieve properly and, and go through the normal dying process with family members, whether they're dying of COVID or dying of something else. And, you know, I, I believe there is a, you know, increased number of people who are delaying, you know, care. And in fact, we don't know the answer to on this one gentleman that we had that did have COVID, but, you know, was he fearful? We don't know, but was he fearful? A question I have of going to the hospital and picking it up. So he decided sure. not to go and, you know, ended up dying of that. But, you know, there are delayed diagnoses for sure that we hear um, on the hospital side because of, you know, their fear of, of, of picking up COVID and staying away. Um, you know, telehealth, tele those uh, televideo visits, I think, have gone up for physicians. And, yeah. you know, so that, that's probably depersonalized, I think, a little bit of uh, health care delivery in general. And, you know, now granted, you know, some of the younger population might say, hey, I'd rather pick up my phone rather than go see a doctor's office and that kind of thing. But, you know, there's something with, you know, the laying of hands, the, the actual physician patient interaction, I think, that's lost in the in the video visit per se. And obviously some of the physical exam, which which is vital to diagnosing yes. uh, certain diseases and things like that. So that part is gone. And um, so, so it definitely has changed things. And, you know, so we still have, you know, patients uh, at the hospital side that, that, and following up with their offices that, you know, some docs are still doing the televisits because, again, the, the patients prefer that and or they still can't get out of the house and or, you know, COVID is still rampant in our community and then they haven't been able to be vaccinated. So, you know, still trying to... to uh, protect, but yet still reach out as best we can in 2021 here to, to treat patients. Do you think, as far as your suicides um, being on, on an increase, or you may think it might be on an increase, what is the method of, of suicide that you think has been, has been the most prevalent during this period? Um, you know, 
know, it's uh, probably our number one is overdosing. Um, opioids, probably number one, methamphetamine and alcohol. Okay. Um, and then uh, firearms. Okay. I was talking to a coroner in, in Southern Ohio and he had mentioned that he saw two spikes in the overdoses. One was in May and one was in January. And he had direct relation of those to the uh, stimulus payments that were given out. Mm. Suddenly people have yeah. more money that they had normally, they can buy more drugs than they would normally do, and then they overdose. Yeah, and um, so I can concur on the January spike, absolutely. Um, and I was not in uh, last year in May, so I can't speak to that. Um, but yeah, I, I can follow up on that and, and try to look that up and, and see what we can come, see if there was a spike there for us to. That'd be interesting because you know, it's, it's one of those things you didn't you don't think about that it's it's a non-COVID related directly, mm -hmm. but indirectly, you know, you get a person who's an addict or, or let's say maybe not an addict, but a, a recreational user that suddenly has more money to buy drugs with, they're gonna buy more drugs than they normally do. Right. They're gonna use more of them and then they overdose. I didn't, yep. I didn't even consider that. That didn't ever enter my mind. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'm, I'm not a user, so I can't, I can't think that way. Right, um, right. When you when you did your autopsy on the COVID patient, um, what did you find? I mean, I, this is a, a physical, I mean, a, a biological question now. But what did you find that what what did they see or what did you see in terms of his physical condition that COVID had had uh, affected him? Yeah, I mean, so the, the, of the, the cases that we have had here, so we don't have a forensic pathologist right now. So um, cases that we do the full uh, open autopsies, we have to send to Cleveland on those. Um, but so, and again, we try to be uh, stewards of the uh, county's resources, but yet obviously make sure that we do the proper job as a coroner as well. So, um, so those have all been closed cases, or, or we haven't done open autopsies on them. But um, findings on a couple that have come through when we get the medical records and reviewing them, they're you know predominantly pulmonary or, or lung disease. So they get the COVID pneumonia and they get a, a, a syndrome called acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. And, you know, that's usually, uh, you know, the, the main, one of the main factors that causes death. So the lungs, are, the lungs are just full of water? Is that or full of fluid? Yeah, for, for, full of fluid. Yeah. So basically they're, yeah, they're membranes and yeah, they, they, they disintegrate. But then the cells also release these things called cytokines and, and other uh, inflammatory factors that then spread through the whole body. And I mean, you may hear, you know, people dying of, you know, they're having clotting and, and those kind of things. And so that, that's from the release of the, the cells that become infected from the COVID virus. So you get blood clots everywhere? Uh, they can, um, but I think pred the predominant though is to die from the, the, uh, acute, the ARDS or the, the lung disease where basically their lungs you know, sort of fill with fluid. They can't inflate. They can't inflate. They can't do gas exchange at the alveoli, which is, you know, where the really small little saccules in the uh, terminal part of the we call them bronchioles or lungs. But because the air can't, the oxygen and carbon dioxide can't move across the membrane because there's extra fluid there from the breakdown of cells and the inflammation going on there. That you know, in essence, they die as a, of asphyxiation wow. uh, because you can't you can't get oxygen to them and get rid of the carbon dioxide. Do you think I was talking to a New York City nurse that she had mentioned that she had one of her patients had been waiting for a lung transplant since April, and it hit me. I'm thinking this is going to be a long time, and we won't be able to have any people with COVID-free lungs to get transplants from because you know. Boy. You know? Yeah, you're right on that. I, I never even thought of that, but yeah, that's a that's a real real problem for sure. I mean, if you can advertise that you got a COVID free lung, you got you can charge top dollar for it. I'm, I'm, I mean, it sounds crazy, but to find one that's COVID free will be difficult, and it, the people who need them has just gone up, you know, dramatically. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great point. That's a very good point. It, it never occurred to me until until I just got thinking about it. Um, yeah. What would here's my question to you. And this is what I want. I want. I would like for you to have the opportunity to either tell the artist or tell the audience uh, who's looking at the artwork. What would you like them, to, the viewer of your artwork, to walk away with in terms of impact on this? What would you like them to say? This is what my view of COVID 
has been, or this is what I think, I, I wish you would walk away with this feeling. What would it be? Yeah, you know, um, I guess it's uh, off the top of my head, I, I envision um, kind of COVID, kind of the way, uh, basically the wave of COVID coming in and, you know, causing death, causing social destruction, causing social isolation, and, um, you know, the development of vaccine, healthcare workers struggling to keep up, but then um, kind of a combination of, of healthcare workers continuing on, you know, not, uh, you know, abandoning ship, but if anything, getting stronger, vaccine coming, and um, life becoming the new normal, whatever that is. Um, Do you feel that there might be a, a, a level of PTSD among healthcare workers for a while? Yes. I'm sure it's been addressed. I'm sure it has been, but I, I work with vets a lot, and I and I so I, I've come to know a lot about the PTSD uh, issue and the challenge. And yeah, and that'll be a continued problem for a while because yeah. you know we're not out of the woods. I mean, it's again in our county a, a significant decrease, so we're down to a quarter of our maximum where we are where we were. But uh, yeah, I know like LA and New York. I mean, I, I'm sure they're still suffering at a significant level. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I have not been up to date on their statistics and where they are in their pandemic. Yeah, I would say so. I, 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 the news is good. And then when I talked to people from nursing homes, they said, yeah, you know, we're, we're really scared. And yeah. part of it is the fact that they feel so guilty because that they let down their residents because somehow the disease got in. Yeah. And that's, that's what's really, that's really affecting them right now is because they, they, and then when it goes to the nursing home, it just goes through everybody. It was just amazing. Yep. I don't know if you got, if you got a chance to, to recognize that in terms of the people coming through, not, not your office per se. Yeah. Like I said, most of those won't come to our office. Um, it's kind of the, the unknown or the people usually that are at, at home and, and dying uh, in their house or, you know, their, their place of residence, not, not in a, uh, uh, institution. Right, right. Wow. Yeah. Well, listen, I truly appreciate all the effort you put in, and I'm glad that you became the coroner there. Oh, thank you, John. I appreciate it. I'd love yeah, to come down and see well, you guys. Good, I, luck, I, with, I, good, I, good I, luck with your work, too. It sounds like you're doing great things there. Uh, well, really well, we'll, we'll, the you. article will be done by April, and we will invite you down here for the for the grand ceremony. It's a little town in Tiffin, but I'd like to also talk to you about, you know, off off topic on something else, Not not at this time about uh, having some, when, when it's available, when, when, you, when it's possible. Uh, okay. if, you, if you want to do a Zoom class or a Zoom uh, meeting with my class on autopsies and how you perform them as, as a coroner, because my, you know, my students are in this, in this course that I teach. I'm a chemist, but I'm learning how to do forensics. And okay. all the kids want to talk about is, you know, cutting up on dead bodies. And I've seen, <laughs> I've seen at least 50 or 75 autopsies, and they still bug me. I still can't do it. I, I have a hard time with it. I've seen them all over the world and I've seen them, you know, in my backyard and I just have a hard time, but the students love it. Yeah. So yeah. I'm like, okay, well, fine. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things, you know, and in fact, I still remember, you know, as a emergency medicine resident, there was a uh, state highway patrolman who came in and he was asking me to draw a legal blood draw on a uh, accident victim that came in and I'm like, sure. And I go into it, come right out. He's like, man, he goes, there's no way I could do what you do. And I go, officer, and there's no way I could do what you do. So it's just, you know, kind of the light bulb went on. It just takes all of us to make the world go around and, uh, you know, just treat everybody like your family and we will all get through it, you know, and make life that much more pleasant for everybody else. Well, bless you for that, for that outlook on life. I appreciate that. I will be in touch with you uh, throughout the semester. All right. And I'll, let, I'll let you know when we get the artwork done. Okay. All right, man. Good luck. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye.